Hi there, and welcome to another Tech Tips Tuesday. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the vacuum tube and how it works. So we'll take a look at the diode, the triode, the tetrode, and the pentode. So let's get started. The first tube that we're going to take a look at is the diode. Di meaning two, ode meaning electrode, two electrodes. This is the symbol for a diode vacuum tube that's indirectly heated. This is the symbol for a diode vacuum tube that's directly heated. And I'll explain this here in just a moment. So whenever you look at a vacuum tube, you want to remember this. The upside down T is the plate or the anode. Okay. So you want to remember that. This is the cathode. It looks like the letter C turned kind of like this. All right. The cathode on the data sheets is marked with a K. You'd think they'd use a C, but it's a K. Same with this plate. Now these are the filaments inside this tube because this is a directly heated vacuum tube, but the filaments are the cathode. So these are usually marked with H for heaters, but they are the cathode as well. Now the difference between these two diodes is this is an indirectly heated tube. So this means that there's a filament structure inside of a pipe inside that vacuum tube and the filament structure has to heat the pipe up first before electrons will flow. So the, the turn on time for these tubes or, you know, the time to when they actually start to work is between tw uh, 10 and 20 seconds or something like that usually. For a directly heated vacuum tube, it's usually oh, about three seconds or so and they're ready to use. Now, directly heated vacuum tubes are not only diodes or, you know, triodes and tetrodes and pentodes as well. You have a directly heated vacuum tube in your house right now if you have a microwave oven. The uh, magnetron tube inside your microwave oven is a directly heated tube. So when you put a piece of food or whatever in your microwave oven and you turn it on, you know, you usually hear the fan start and it starts to hum. Now, if you listen very carefully to that microwave oven, in about three seconds after you turn it on, you'll kind of hear the microwave oven sound like it's bogging a little bit. You'll hear, you know, the tone go down. And that's because the filament structure inside the magnetron tube is heating up and it's, you know, obviously starting to draw a current. That's how that works. So most houses that have, uh, you know, microwave ovens obviously have a, a vacuum tube in them. So an indirectly heated vacuum tube is uh, used for many, many different things. They're all different shapes and sizes of, of uh, actual tubes. They're used as detectors and, and rectifiers and DC restorers and all sorts of different kinds of things in, um, uh, in radios and televisions and all sorts of different kinds of test gear. This kind of tube here is usually only used as a rectifier. Yeah, there are some cases where they use them for other things as well, but um, a directly heated rectifier tube is, you know, power supply stuff usually. That's the most common place that you're going to encounter something like this. A good example of a directly heated rectifier tube would be a 5U4, a 5R4, 5Y3, 5Y4, uh, even in the old Rogers radios, the 2X3s, things like that. A 2X3 would actually look just like this if you were to look at the schematic symbol of a 2X3. A, a 5Y4 has two plates so that you can use it as a uh, full wave rectifier. This would be considered half wave right here. You'd be using this in a half wave situation. Okay, so keep in mind the upside down T is the plate. That's one you want to always remember that. And this C that you see is kind of turned like this is the cathode. All right, very important things to remember. Now the electrons flow from the hot surface to a positively charged surface, all right, so which is the plate. So the anode is has a positive charge on it and the electrons will flow from the cathode to the plate inside of a vacuum tube. Which brings me to uh, conventional flow and electron flow. I've had a, a few people mention, I see that you use conventional flow and of course vacuum tubes and you know circuitry uses electron flow and things like that. Whenever you're working with a schematic it is beneficial for you to think with conventional flow because that's pretty much the way everything is drawn and it makes things quite a bit easier to think about especially in vacuum tube radios. Uh, they have you know negative supplies, bias supplies and all sorts of uh, you know different kind of voltages here and there and tapped off of different resistors and you know they lift the the center tap of the transformer to create a, a, a bias supply in a lot of the radios. If you were to think of the entire schematic as electron flow it would make things quite a bit more difficult to work on. 
So whenever you're using a schematic, conventional flow is much easier to work with. Uh, no matter how you've learned it, whatever you're good with, of course, is whatever you're good with. For myself, whenever I'm looking at a schematic conventional flow, 100%, looking at the vacuum tube and picturing it as its own entity and the electron flow going in there is absolutely fine. I do it all the time. Whatever makes things easier for you. Okay? So it's the same thing with this directly heated vacuum tube, the electron flow from the hot surface to the plate. All right. So whenever you put a positive charge on the plate, the electrons will flow from the hot surface to that positive to that positive uh, uh, charged aperture, which is the plate or the anode, whatever you want to call that inside of this tube. All right. So this is the diode here and we're going to go over to the bench in just a little bit here and uh, we'll talk a little bit more and I'll show you the difference between a directly heated tube and uh, and an indirectly heated tube. I'll try and get my camera nice and close and, and uh, point out the parts inside the vacuum tube. You can even figure out the pinout of a vacuum tube just by looking through the glass and looking to where the lead in wires connect to and I'll show you how to do that as well. So next we're going to take a look at the triode. In order to control the electron flow inside of a vacuum tube really use the vacuum tube as an amplifier, we need to put a grid inside it. All right, and this is how we draw a triode. This is indirectly heated as well. Tri meaning three, ode, electrode, three electrodes. Again, we have the plate here. This is the grid, and this is the cathode. Now, by putting a negative voltage on the grid of this tube will stop the electron flow from traveling from the cathode to the plate. As we make the grid more positive, it kind of acts as a shutter for electrons. It opens and it allows more electrons to flow to the plate. Hence, we have an electron valve. Now, we also have directly heated triodes. And you see these mostly in transmitter service, you know, things like a 3-500Z or something like that, and, you know, in the very large amplifying tubes. Uh, for audio use in things like, um, you know, home stereos and working on radios and test gear and things like that, it's rare to see a directly heated triode. Again, basically used in amateur service and in transmitting service. So what we're going to do is we are going to focus on this triode here, and we won't really look at this too much right now. Uh, again, the, there's so much with vacuum tubes, there's so many topics and so many different kinds of tubes and installations that uh, I could be here for a very, very long time. So I'm only going to focus on the really popular stuff today. Again, this is an indirectly heated tube. We haven't drawn the filament in here. If we wanted to draw the filament, it's shown underneath the cathode of the vacuum tube. So in order to picture how an actual triode works, what I'm going to do is use a light bulb, a Venetian blind and a wall to uh, make this uh, a little bit clearer. And uh, you'll see what I mean here. Again, understanding how all of this stuff works really is about visualization. So what I'm going to do is clean off the board here and in just a second, I'll be right back with that drawn. All right, so this may make understanding how a vacuum tube works just a little bit easier. We have a light bulb, a Venetian blind, and a wall. All right, so the light bulb being the cathode, kind of represents a cathode, it glows, right? The Venetian blind is the grid, and the wall is the plate. When you put a negative voltage on the grid, the Venetian blind closes. When you put a positive voltage on the grid, the Venetian blind opens. The light shining out of the light bulb, you would look at as being the electrons coming off of the cathode of the tube, okay? So by putting a positive charge on the plate, it wants to attract the, elect the electrons from the cathode. So it pulls them towards the positively charged aperture inside the tube. And whenever you look at a vacuum tube, the outermost aperture that you see, it's usually gray or a dark color, that usually is the plate inside of the tube. In some cases, there is a shield on the outside, but that's very rare. So most of the times, like if you look at a 6L6, you look right through the glass, you can see the plate. The part that glows in the tube is the cathode, okay? So again, if we put a positive charge, the Venetian blinds open, we have electron flow 
All right, so technically, you know, if we were to put positive here and negative here, you know, we would be drawing current at this particular time. If you put a negative charge on the grid, the Venetian blinds close. The light can no longer shine on the wall anymore because the Venetian blinds are closed, right? So the electrons aren't getting through. And that's really what the grid is inside of a vacuum tube. You can picture it like a Venetian blind that just opens and closes when you put a positive or a negative charge on it. Now, depending on the tube and the biasing, they'll turn on and off at different rates, and you can kind of almost set that where you would like that to turn on and turn off. All right, and then, of course, that's in the circuitry that surrounds the actual triode itself. And that's really how all vacuum tubes work. If you have a tetrode or a pentode, you're just adding more Venetian blinds is really what you're doing. All right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a tetrode. That will be the next tube we check out. In order to improve upon the usefulness of a triode, we can introduce another grid. That extra grid makes it a tetrode. So tet being four, tetra being four, and ode, electrode, four electrodes. All right, I'll draw the symbol for a tetrode. And that's what a tetrode looks like. So again, we have the plate, we have the cathode, we have grid one, which is the control grid. This is grid two. So whenever you're looking at a tube and you're counting grids, up from the cathode, it's always grid one, grid two, grid three, grid four, and so on, as you're counting towards the plate. This is now grid two, and grid two is called the screen grid. You want to remember that, all right? So grid number two is classified as the screen. Now the advantage of inserting this extra grid in the tube lowers the inter-electrode capacitance inside this tube by creating an electrostatic shield. Now, whenever you are looking on a schematic, say you're troubleshooting a radio or you know any kind of test gear or an amplifier, whenever you see a screen grid, there's usually a positive voltage on it, all right? So by putting a positive voltage on this grid creates an electrostatic shield between the control grid and the plate, lowering the inter-electrode capacitance. If you were to look at a triode, you have the cathode, the grid, and the plate. So the cathode's right in the center, all right? The grid is looks like a spring that's kind of put around that cathode. It's not touching it in any way, shape, or form, but that's the grid. It's like spiral uh, wound wire there, all right? And then the outermost aperture inside the vacuum tube is called the plate, and that's usually what you can see right through the glass. Now, between the grid and the plate, we have capacitance, right? Because they're, you know, they're close to each other. Whenever you have two metal surfaces that are close to each other, technically you have a, a form of capacitor, all right? By inserting the screen grid between the control grid and the plate inside that tube, adding that extra grid creates this shield and lowers the inter-electrode capacitance, allowing this tube to oscillate and amplify at much, much higher frequencies. And that's a very major advantage of the tetrode. All right, now we have all sorts of different kinds of tetrodes. Uh, if you're used to playing in the audio world, you'll notice the KT series tubes, the KT66, KT88, and the KT stands for kinkless tetrode. And really what that means is they've uh, lowered or virtually eliminated the kink in the plate curves. All right, there's a kink in there. And they've done that by aligning the grids. So basically you have the cathode, you have one grid, another grid, the grids don't touch each other. They're basically just, you know, spaced away from each other. But the wires of the grid are perfectly in alignment with each other so that they don't obstruct the electron flow. It doesn't have to do that through it. It basically just flies straight through the grid. And by doing that, we really dramatically lower a thing called secondary emission. Now, you can view secondary emission inside of a vacuum tube as the electrons flowing towards the plate as basically a fire hose being shot at a wall. So if you're shooting water out of a fire hose at a wall, you're gonna get lots of spraying when it hits that wall, all right? 
So picture that water as electrons and that spray is now secondary emission. Those are electrons hitting the plate and bouncing back into the tube causing issues. By aligning the grids greatly reduces secondary emission in tetrodes. All right, and then of course we have another scheme, uh, a way of doing this in a pentode as well. And we'll cover that when we talk about pentodes. All right, by also um, a high anode slope resistance, we also get quite a bit more gain out of this tube. And uh, that's by introducing this screen grid here. And, and again, we would need to look at, at an actual chart to compare that, but we'll keep it simple for now. So grid one, again, control grid. Grid two, the screen grid, remember as you're counting towards the plate, you're always counting up in numbers. We have pentodes, we have pentagrids, we have hexodes, we have all sorts of different kinds of tubes with all sorts of different numbers of grids inside them. Uh, this could get extremely long because the difference in tubes, and there's so many different kinds of tubes, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna stick to the popular tubes right now. And uh, next, we're gonna press on to the pentode. Another very effective way to stop secondary emission is to add another grid to the tetrode. And that grid is called a suppressor grid. Now we have a pentode. All right, so I'll draw a pentode now. So just like all the other tubes, we have a plate, we have a cathode, we have grid one, which is the control grid. We have grid two, which is the screen grid. Right, G2 here. And now we have grid three, which is called the suppressor grid. And this is G3. Now, you'll notice in a lot of tubes that they tie the suppressor grid to the cathode. All right, that's effective. And you'll notice in some tubes they don't, like a 6AU6, you can actually uh, put the suppressor grid where you want to actually attach it. All right, the suppressor grid is a grid that stops secondary emission because it's tied to the actual cathode of the tube or it's tied to ground or some variant of ground. And any of the electrons that want to hit the plate and rebound back into the tube are pretty much stopped by that suppressor grid. Now, this is called a pentode, right? But we also have a thing called a beam power tube, and they are also called pentodes as well, but they could be looked at as a tetrode with beam forming plates. What I'm gonna do is clear the board off here, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. A really good example of a beam power pentode, or they call it a beam power tube, and it's classified as a pentode, is the 6L6. And the 6L6 is probably one of the most common tubes on the earth, aside from the 12AX7 and uh, possibly the 6GH8A. So the symbol for that tube is very much the same as a regular pentode, except a beam power pentode like the 6L6 really is a tetrode with beam forming plates. And they called it a pentode. They classified that beam forming plate as, you know, another grid or whatever they're calling it, grid three. And uh, I believe that had to do with patenting way back in the day. So um, really, I guess we're dealing with politics at this point. A uh, really good example of that, if you'd like to look at this for yourself, is if you have an RK39 vacuum tube and you have an 807 vacuum tube. If you look inside the two of them, the electrical structure is identical. The RK39 is ruggedized, it has you know, larger spacers and there's you know, much more glass inside the tube and support structures. But electrically, the RK39 and the 807 are pretty much identical inside. You can see the beam forming plates and everything inside the tube, yet the RK39 is called a tetrode and the 807 is called a pentode. It's the same with the 1625. The 1625 is the 12.6 uh, volt heater version of the 807. So, so in order to uh, eliminate a little bit of confusion here, all right, in the beam power pentode, a lot of the times they draw that third 
uh, the beam forming plates inside this tube here, they draw a connection to the cathode, not to be confused with a regular pentode because in some of the pentodes they have a connection between the suppressor grid and the cathode as well. You'll also know in, note in a beam power tube that sometimes they eliminate that one center line there trying to show that it's a beam forming plate. You can kind of picture a beam going through there. And some engineers that draw 6L6s in their schematic just completely eliminate that grid altogether and just draw it as a tetrode because really that's what it is. It's a tetrode with beam forming plates. This tube here is an 807. It's classified as a beam power tube or a pentode. This tube here is an RK39 and it's a tetrode with beam forming plates in it. So this is the rugged version of this tube. This tube was designed to fly around Royal Canadian Air Force right there. All right, so if we look inside this tube, this outer aperture that you see, the dark aperture in here, is the plate or the anode inside this tube. And these two silvery things that you see here, just below this plate, is the beam forming electrodes. All right. Now if we look in this RK39, you can see the beam forming electrodes in here as well. This is the plate. And as you can see, this is, you know, made quite a bit uh, more rugged than the other tube. You can see the big thick porcelain spacers and you can see how they've, you know, got these support posts going into the glass down here. So it's a really, really tough version of the 807 is really all that this is. And it's quite a bit heavier too, a porcelain base on it. You know, where this is just a standard base on the bottom. Looks to be made out of Bakelite or some like material. So if we look in the bottom of the tube here, this one's relatively easy to see inside. If you see these two coppery-like looking posts, those are the screen grid posts. So there's wire wrapped around those posts all the way to the top of the tube. Right in the center here is the cathode, and that white kind of squiggly wire you see there is the filament that goes inside the cathode. That's what heats the cathode up. Right next to these coppery looking posts are the screen grid posts, and they're kind of hard to see in the bottom here. They're covered up by these two tabs, which are the uh, beam forming plates underneath here. And then on the edges here, you can see these wires running down into here. All right, those hold the beam forming plates and make the connection to the beam forming plates. On the top, this wire that runs up to the cap attaches to the plate. So the reason they put the cap on the top of this tube here is so that they can use a really high voltage and not risk any kind of arc over. Now the 807 really is just a beefed up 6L6. So here's a 6L6. All right, and you can see that they're really the same tube. You know, inside they're virtually identical, except this one here does not have the plate cap. The plate wire is led to a pin on this octal base right here. So virtually no difference between this tetrode and this beam power pentode here. Again, most likely they named them differently for patent reasons and stuff like that way back when. Here's a nice little triode that displays how it works, nice and clearly. So you can see the grid connection here, runs to this collar, and that is the grid structure inside. Now the grid in this kind of tube is a little bit different than like a 6L6 or a 6V6 or something like that. They're more of a rod fashion and they've got rings that hold those rods in place. And right in the center, these two leads right here attach to the filament that goes in the center of the grid. This outer aperture you see here, again, is the plate and it comes out of the top of the tube here. So this was intended for some transmitting service or something like that. You can see the little rods of the grid here running up into the tube. So the signal goes in here and of course the amplified signal would be present up here. All right, let's take a look at what an indirectly heated vacuum tube looks like when it's warming up. So I'll just apply some filament power here. Now that glow you see is the filament there. That's heating up the pipe. Now if you keep an eye on that little piece right in the center there, you'll see it start to glow orange here in just a little bit. When that starts to glow orange, 
this tube is ready to start working. You see how it's slowly starting to glow orange in there? So that filament structure that you see in the bottom that's lit up really bright has to heat that pipe orange hot in order for the cathode in this to start emitting electrons. This tube here is a directly heated rectifier, so it's pretty much ready as soon as you apply filament voltage to it. So what I'll do is I'll just put filament voltage on the pin here and you can keep an eye on the top of the vacuum tube. And you'll see these start to glow almost immediately. So here I go, I'll clip this on here. And now the tube is ready to go, just that fast. So this is how a 5R4 and a 5U4 and a 5Y3 and 5Y4 and all of those particular vacuum tubes work. And this is the plate aperture, the outer aperture there. You can kind of see the filaments glowing in the bottom there. This one here is designed for full wave rectification. There's actually two diodes inside here with a common cathode, which is the filament structure. In the very near future, I may be introducing some teardowns into Tech Tips Tuesdays. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to call it something else yet. Maybe I'll name it a different series at this point. I'm really not quite sure. You can leave your comments below. So uh, I do believe that that would probably be beneficial to learning electronics. There's a lot of really neat things to discover by looking inside of you know, well-designed devices like, say, Tektronix oscilloscopes and all sorts of various test gear. So if you enjoyed this episode on vacuum tubes, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more episodes just like this in the very near future and maybe some teardowns as well. All right, take care. See you next time.